uh, this video is basically a brief description of pages 316 to maybe 319 or 320 in the R3 workbook. Um, I'd like to talk about fluorescence, phosphorescence, and chemiluminescence. Um, let's, st let's start off. If you uh, have a molecule and it, re it interacts with light, uh, we know that electrons, if it's UV or visible light, uh, electrons are promoted from lower energy levels to high energy levels in a process of excitation or absorption. Well, what happens to the excited state? That's the question. Uh, there's all kinds of things that could happen. I mean, if the input energy was high enough, you could actually photoionize the molecule if the electron would just take off with some kinetic energy. But let's assume it just goes to the excited state, that it's not photoionized. Well, then to uh, basically to return it to the ground state, which is lower in energy, uh, there's many ways to do this. One can imagine a molecule could come in and simply collide with it uh, in the process that the excited state molecule transfers its energy to the colliding molecule, which goes off at a higher kinetic energy, uh, and then the molecule returns that was excited to go down to the ground state. And this process, uh, that uh, basically the energy is released as heat. Uh, and it's a non-radiative process. We call this quenching. Um, and there's many different kinds of quenching, collisional quenching um, as an example. Now, another possibility has happened is that that excited state electron can fall back down to the ground state in the process emitting light. Uh, and there's two different kinds of processes in which this occurs. One is called fluorescence and one is called phosphorescence. Let's look at a trivial case first of, uh, but not trivial, but fluorescence. Imagine I excite an, an electron and, and this is pretty evident in this diagram. Now remember when you excite an electron, and this is referred to on page 316, uh, and 317, electrons are really light compared to the uh, nucleus. So when we excite an electron from a lower um, a ground state to a higher energy state, that occurs almost instantaneously and uh, without movement of the nuclei. But now once you have the excited state, there's a readjustment in the structure of the uh, molecule in the excited states, and that's sort of illustrated here. Here we have this sort of potential well describing the ground state. And notice that the excited state is shifted to the right. If this is reaction coordinates, it would appear maybe there is some kind of, uh, maybe the electron went to an antibonding orbital, for instance, and so there's some uh, lengthening of the bond. So there is a physical change, but that occurs after the absorption process. Okay, so what happens uh, next? Uh, on, on page 317, uh, there's a diagram that's very similar to this on the bottom page which suggests that if the ground, if the first excited state uh, is very different structurally than the ground state, then that transition is less likely to occur. That, I think that would make sense if you look at the bottom picture on 317. So if the ground state, which is here, the first excited state in terms of the electronic levels is not that much distant, uh, different, then this tr transition can occur. So let's look at these different diagrams. We see in the ground state and the first excited electronic state, but we also have these horizontal lines going across them. These represent different vibrational states within the molecule, whether it be the ground state or the excited state. Uh, typically what happens in the ground state, the lowest energy form, uh, the, the molecule is in the lowest vibrational state. We'll call that state zero. Now all of a sudden the photon comes along, it will then promote and basically uh, go to a higher energy level. Uh, and of course, it's followed by relaxation of the molecule. But now this is the first excited state. But notice that it can go to a variety of positions here, a variety of different vibrational states within the overall first excited state. Uh, typically, they all start off from the ground state and the lowest vibrational level. But in obviously in this process of excitation, we're going to be changing bond lengths. There's going to be, we can populate any one of these possible vibrational levels here. So then what happens? Well, it turns out, again, uh, we're going to take the electron back down uh, in the process of light emission. But what happens first is that the mild, that, that when you add uh, the energy and it goes to a higher vibrational state, it can relax in a radiationless process as my cursor is showing to lower vibrational states, but still within the excited state of the molecule. Then it could essentially uh, take off, in this case from the lowest vibrational state, and can enter uh, some of these other vibrational states within the ground state. 
So if you look at it, the uh, energy of the photon to excite the molecule is much greater than the energy of the emitted light or photon as it relaxes from the excited state to some vibrational level within the, the ground state. So let's look at the excitation. Down here uh, shows es essentially the excitation spectra for this molecule, which is really essentially the same thing as the absorption spectra. Notice down here there's like a curve that represents the overall absorption or what we would call the excitation spectra. These little n uh, lines here, numbers, represent like for instance 0, 1 prime, represent the uh, excitation of a molecule down here in the zero vibrational level up to this state here, which is the first vibrational state of the excited state. Likewise, we have O1 prime to O2 prime, and obviously the highest energy transition is from this state here, a zero vibrational state, up to, like, we'll call it uh, 8, which is not even listed here, uh, and that would be the highest energy trans, um, transition, which would represent the uh, lowest wavelength. So I think you can see the origin of an approximate absorption curve as we actually um, excite this molecule to these various vibrational states. Now, what happens in the emission? Well, again, we get vibrational relaxation to the lowest vibrational state within the excited state, but then we can get de excitation by release of a photon as it collapses to any of these states. So it goes here, uh, as listed here, it goes from 0 prime down to uh, either 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in terms of the ground state vibrational levels. So I think you can see that you're going to get this as an emission. So in fluorescence, we typically have an excitation spectra and an emission spectra, and they're often mirror images of each other. If we were to do this with a fluorophore molecule that can absorb and emit light, but it was in a gas phase and it wasn't bumping into things, well, probably what would happen is we get an immediate excitation to some state and then immediate fallback to the same state that it started with, in which case the energy of the photon promoting it would be equal to the energy emitted. Uh, that would be called resonance fluorescence, and we don't see that in solution, because uh, in solution we have uh, basically different vibrational states that are, that, are, that are populated in part due to interactions with the solvent molecules as the molecule becomes excited. Uh, again, in solution, what happens is vibrational, I mean, collisions with molecules in, in the solution with the excited state fluorophore quickly drops uh, uh, electrons in any of these vibrational states in the first excited state down to this ground vibrational state, and then we get emission from there, and that's reflected in this diagram. So let's look at the, uh, the electron that's promoted. So for example, if we have a um, uh, orbital, molecular orbital and have two electrons in it, and then an electron, I mean a photon is absorbed, uh, one of these electrons goes to a higher energy level. Now notice in this case, uh, if this was the electron that was removed, uh, the spin stays the same. So this is, so there's no uh, unpaired electrons here. So the total S is plus one half minus one half, which is zero. So this is a singlet state. Um, and then when it's uh, essentially excited, uh, it also remains in a singlet state. And this, as we saw before, is a spin allowed transition. Um, but however, if we have a state that looks like this, and it's got two electrons in it, and we were to somehow p uh, put an electron in and go to this state, notice that we've changed the spin state. This is a singlet state. Here we have a total spin of one because I've got two, basically, um, unpaired electrons pointing in the same direction. So it's two times one plus one, and this is a triplet. So this transition would be forbidden. And again, the meaning of that is that um, it's uh, unlikely to happen. Um, but it can happen at a much, much, much slower rate, uh, so hence it's forbidden. The bottom of page 319 sort of discusses this. In typical fluorescence, what we have is we'll promote uh, with, with retaining the same uh, state in terms of a singlet or triplet that we had initially. Uh, so fluorescence involves, let's say, promotion from a singlet state to a singlet state and then a return to a singlet state. It's been allowed. Fluores um, that's fluorescence. Phosphorescence is when, and you can see in the bottom of page 319, I didn't do all the diagram, is that if we do something like that, in other words, we promote uh, the electron, uh, again, and then the spin allowed state to a singlet state, but then somehow if there's some kind of energy uh, uh, addition to change that to the triplet state, then what we have is this scenario down here, and then, uh, so the system is crossed over from the excited electron being in a singlet state 
to now the excited electron being in a triplet state. So now it's got to fall back, and it's got to fall back to the ground state into a singlet, and that's going to be really, really slow uh, because it's a forbidden transition, but it can occur. We call that process phosphorescence. So the difference between fluorescence and phosphorescence is that essentially when we get fluorescence, we get, let's say, a singlet to a singlet state conversion on the um, absorption of a photon, and then it's emitted back to the singlet state. So it's been allowed and it occurs very quickly. Whereas the phosphorescence on the promotion of a singlet to a singlet, if there is somehow crosses over uh, with a little energy to form a triplet state, then that next process back to, to the ground state in the singlet uh, state is, is definitely disfavored and it takes much, um, very, very long time for that to happen. While we're talking singlets and triplets, again, I thought I'd, br I'd bring back in molecular orbitals for dioxygen. Again, dioxygen is a ground state diradical uh, in the ground state. So if you look at it, its electronic configuration, we have two electrons in pi antibonding orbitals, and they're spin up. This is the lowest energy confirmation because Hunt's law will basically says that the um, basically lowest energy is when you maximize the total spin. So here we have maximized the total spin. Uh, one half plus one half is one. So the number of spin states is uh, the multiplicity is two times s plus one. Two times one plus one is a triplet. So oxygen is the ground state triplet. But now, if we were to put energy into oxygen, dioxygen in the ground state, I could flip the spin. Now, of course, now um, so now we have a triplet state. So I mean that's sort of a forbidden, and it has an energy barrier that's significant. But we could do it. Now, these states are both excited states, if you think about it, uh, because now, in fact, the total spin here is 0. So 2 times 0 plus 1 is 1. These are singlet states. Uh, so in fact, though, uh, these singlet states are excited states, and they're more reactive than the ground state dioxygen. And remember, when we talked about organic molecules, uh, typically they react by uh, by giving up two electrons at a time when they're being oxidized. But you see, now uh, it's not so easy to react organic molecules with ground state oxygen because we have this spin problem here because these are both spin um, aligned. Um, but it more readily can react with trip, uh, with singlet oxygen because you can imagine a couple electrons being inserted into here um, as we lose electrons from the organic molecule that's being oxidized. So singlet oxygen is much more reactive than triplet oxygen. Um, here's an example of a singlet oxygen reaction. And again, remember, this is the Lewis structure for dioxygen. We don't see lone pairs of electron, lone electrons here. It's not a ground state radical anymore. We can imagine that it's, um, it's been paired now, and this is the excited state. And you can imagine that uh, it can oxidize organic molecules like this. And I think we talked about some of these reactions. Uh, following this flow of electrons, we can just come out here, overcome here, and we can end up forming peroxides. So singlet oxygen is much more reactive than triplet ground state oxygen with organic molecules. Uh, and if you think about it, there's one other process that's talked about in the workbook. What if I have uh, some organic molecule that absorbs sunlight? You have it out on the line to dry. Uh, what it does is going to go up to a singlet, uh, to, uh, maybe it's a singlet to singlet conversion. So let's say there's, a, well, uh, let's take an example of an organic molecule, uh, a dye molecule present in some clothes that you've got out in the sun. It absorbs light. Uh, you can promote an electron, let's say, from a singlet state to a singlet state. Now that molecule has got to fall back. Fall back to the, that electron has to fall back to the ground state. It can possibly do so by colliding with oxygen. Remember we said oxygen, uh, molecules can come in and collisionally quench it. But what if, what if triplet oxygen, ground state oxygen, came in and interacted with that excited state um, dye molecule? Well, the dye molecule goes to the ground state, but maybe oxygen gains enough energy to be converted from the triplet to the singlet state. And in doing so, you generate right there by the dye molecule singlet oxygen. And singlet oxygen is very reactive. So what it can do is react with the organic molecule, especially if you have conjugation in the molecule. And what happens when it inserts, you're going to end up screwing up the conjugation, and you're going to end up photobleaching the molecule, the dye molecule. So effectively, you can lose color. So in that case, it's a simple way to transfer energy in which we take a dye molecule, promote it to a singlet state, and it goes back to the ground state um, by essentially colliding with dioxygen in the um, ground state triplet form, but gives it the energy to go to the singlet form, where then it can react with the dye molecule covalently. So I hope you get the understanding that there's a difference between fluorescence and phosphorescence, and a little bit greater understanding about singlet, singlet 
and triplet states.